expected a lot of people are already traveling, but uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, <clears throat> so we're going to do sort of the last of our three RL lectures, although maybe we'll, we'll do a little bit of uh, the model-based version of RL <coughs> in one of the boutique lectures. But uh, <clears throat> I want to, I mean, first of all, especially since there's a few less of us, I think uh, if you guys have any questions whatsoever about RL, you can ask me anything anytime. But uh, <clears throat> Abhishek in particular uh, promised that I would fill in a few details, and I fully intend to do that. Uh, connecting some of the ideas we talked about already from policy search and black box optimization to the actor critic kind of ideas that he talked about and why that can help with sample efficiency. But I also want to talk through um, just a couple of specific examples and maybe even uh, discuss some of the ongoing work to understand when RL works and why it works when it does work. Okay, so let's start. Um, <clears throat> of course, having said that, I should wait to see if there's any questions. Anybody have general questions on, uh, on what we've talked about so far or, or Avi's lecture? Well, anytime, uh, please say anything. Okay, so let's just think about what we've said about RL so far, right? So I started off with a picture of RL as a black box optimization. And I tried to draw some pictures of how, um, you know, zero order methods, methods that don't rely on any analytical gradient calculations of the, of the plant, or they just rely on samples of the of the, you know, or rollouts from your simulator have different properties. Some of them can be desirable, right? So um, if we think about some general cost landscape, but maybe it's got lots of jagged stuff right here and I wanna do an optimization on it, then my gradients might be locally not very informative, but sample-based gradient, you know, sample-based um, algorithms could potentially take samples and estimate the local curvature very nicely and very robustly, right? So <clears throat> that's one of the uh, ideas we've put out there. We talked about very quickly, and I wanna connect the dots again a little bit, um, the policy gradient idea. So I think of this as uh, doing, let's say, direct policy search. So I'm gonna search directly in the parameters of the policy. For instance, if I have some policy with parameters theta, and I wanna search directly in theta, <coughs> um, I could do it with these kind of tools, right? Even if theta is buried in a, in a long-term optimization where I wanna to try to minimize the sum over some long-term rewards where these are the rollouts of simula some simulation, right? So if I write it more carefully here. These are the fundamental equations of optimal control and certainly of RL. Now that looks, the way I've written it, that looks like a constrained optimization. If I wanna minimize this over theta, for instance, that, that looks like some constrained optimization, but because these are um, easily, these equations are easily solved away by just forward simulating from some initial conditions, you can think of this as, you can do this with an unconstrained optimization uh, and black box methods. The policy gradient family of algorithms um, in particular combines some sample-based optimization with analytical gradients of the policy.
which makes total sense, right? If you have uh, a neural network in the middle of as your policy, and we know very well how to, we have very efficient implementations of backprop uh, that run on GPUs. <coughs> so we, you know, we should be able to leverage those gradients. But if we don't know f and we don't maybe know, know the loss function, then um, you know it might make sense to do some sort of black box optimization to take care of these things and some analytical gradients for the policy. And that's the type of algorithms that you explored on your homework and that Abi was starting to talk about in, uh, in his lectures in the policy gradient and actor critic space. So these are the reminders so far, right? Abi talked about a, a couple um, couple big ideas. I mean, he talked about uh, how to specify objectives in the real world, right? So learn, the imitation learning side of, of uh, or sorry, the, the inverse reinforcement learning side of imitation learning. He talked about multitask RL, how you can keep the data collection going if you learn, you know, don't just train it to open a door, train it to open a door and close a door, and then you can get this continuous cycle of of learning, and even if you can't open a door yet, you can make systems that do that very well. But he talked about data efficiency too as a, as a major challenge for getting RL to work in the real world. And there were a couple ideas that he brought up that we want to follow up on today, right? So he talked about actor critic variance of policy gradient. Which can um, can optimize faster. They can be lower, can provide lower variance estimates of the gradient. And he also talked about. Q learning, and in particular, off policy and experience replay kind of ideas. And I think he actually said on his slide, Russ will fill in the details on some of these things. So there we go. So um, to talk through this, I want to use a running example. Um, right, so you remember this example that I cooked up from the force control lecture where we had uh, first a force controller that did this very careful, and I even, I could put it on a teleop and I could have it op stay inside the friction cone, rotate the cheese it box up on the corner, right? And then we talked about stiffness control and how once we had the stiffness control, there was actually an open loop trajectory. You could just close your eyes and move the finger through this um, cycle and it would very robustly flip that box up with the thinking of the programming the virtual spring, right? So what I was doing last night, I, I decided to code up with stiffness control, um, this as an RL problem and throw uh, some of the, some of the you know, popular algorithms at it, PPO and SAC and the like. And you would think, I even said, I said, you know, the, the um, control parameterization of stiffness control should help RL too. Right? So I want to work through that as an example here. This is, um, uh, I think, a, a good example for today. So the first question is, you know, which RL algorithm should we use? And if you look down the list, so we are in the space of, this is what um, RL algorithms are available in the main um, stable baselines three repo. So the, the categories here are uh, your action space. So uh, we're in the box place where we have continuous actions, right? All these other ones are discrete actions, but we have continuous actions if we want to have a, um, you know, let me, let me even write it down here. So my box flip up example. B 
zero in the standard uh, RL case, right? So I'll set up my actions to be um, the XY uh, position for stiffness control, the virtual finger, right? You remember the stiffness control in its full glory um, when your robot is a point finger, it looks almost like PD control. It's PD control plus gravity comp. So it's, that sounds fancy. It is fancy in its generality, but for a point finger, it's kind of just PD control. So we're not doing anything super special there. Um, my observations, we'll, we can have a couple different variants of it, but let's start with just the full state feedback. So that's got the box state plus the finger state. So that's in the plane x, y, theta, x dot, y dot, theta dot, right? The finger state is just, since it's a sphere, I've only given it the two degrees of freedom. Okay, but it adds up, even though it's a super simplified problem, it's still got a lot of state variables and it's not approachable by our brute force gridding um, the state space kind of approaches, right? So we need some sort of neural network kind of function approximators in the middle. You know, my reward now is gonna be something about the box angle. I want the box to be flipped up, right? And then I'll have something about low effort to try to discourage the finger from going totally nuts. And there's actually a few other, please don't go totally nuts terms that I put in. Nothing, nothing scary, it's just like uh, damping. Uh, in general, I'm allergic to trying to tune cost functions, uh, possibly to a fault, but my videos look more janky. Uh, <clears throat> and then, you know, in the RL, uh, in the OpenAI gym case, I'm just gonna um, terminate if time is greater than 10 um, or my multi-body plant crashed. Which I don't feel bad about that because um, this is a game about trying to, I mean, I, I could set the time step of the simulator small enough that it would never crash but I would be paying a price for um, simulations that are reasonable. And I actually wanna discourage simulations that are unreasonable. So I, uh, I think aggressively wanna choose my step size to be large, put myself in a regime, regime where some of the rollouts will crash and tell it it's bad to crash, right? Yeah. That's awesome. So, so the question is, um, there's a subtlety if you've got uh, your RL step size, the, the gym step function takes some amount of, of step, um, you know, has some step size, and then I have a continuous dynamical system underneath that I'm using integration for. I think those are often very different, right? In general, the, um, the step that you need in your gym is like your control frequency, right? Uh, I chose it to be large, like 0.1, even though I'm gonna simulate under the hood, it's at a millisecond or something like this. I started cheating it up to be a few milliseconds, but it's down in the physics dynamics regime in order to do proper time stepping, right? But I, in, and in general, the Drake, Jim, Env uh, will just call the integrator. So if you have whatever systems you have, continuous or discrete or whatever, it will simulate them with whatever resolution you care about for whatever the Jim time step is, which is typically high. Yeah, great question. Okay, so given we have these continuous actions, I mean, that's an action space that's small enough that I could discretize. So I could you know, use a few of the other um, algorithms if we, if we chose to discretize the, the action space. But I think this, in the spirit of making it work for non-point fingers, let's, uh, let's stick to the continuous action space. That's where we normally are for robotics. So there aren't that many choices um, that it rules out a lot of the, um, 
uh, well, let's see, the combination of wanting to do continuous actions and multiprocessing rules out a lot of um, a lot of the algorithms. And that's, I think, true. I think there are um, a few algorithms that tend to be very popular because they can be, they can handle continuous actions and they handle multiprocessing. In particular, PPO is a very popular choice, I think, for those reasons. Okay, so, um, so let's, if you look at, for instance, the OpenAI Learning Dexterity paper, you know, PPO has become the default reinforcement learning algorithm at OpenAI because of its ease of use and good performance. I think in particular in the multiprocessing case. So when you don't care about data, you're gonna do massive multi-threaded stuff, then PPO tends to be the tool of choice. I think if you care about data and you're doing it on a real robot, people will tend to prefer SAC or, or one of the other variants that is using replay and experience in order to, um, to be more data efficient. But we're in simulation world right now, so we're gonna continue to um, see, the, we see this trend. This is recent, I meant to show this last week. This is the recent uh, result from uh, Polkett and his group. Uh, which won the best paper award at, uh, at Coral. Congratulations to them. And it's a nice generalization of the original OpenAI work um, where it's doing, you know, maybe more general, if you will, in-hand reorientation, but it also does it, uh, you know, upside down in un unstable configurations, okay? So I would encourage you to read that paper, but that's not really what we're talking about yet. I just wanted to emphasize that it's, um, it's also using PPO and you see um, it was a night, I, in the context of the last lecture, I was going to point out the uh, impressive ex evaluations that they did. But okay, so um, I told you, you know, packages like stable baselines have gotten pretty pretty good. Stable baselines three, it's really pretty darn easy to implement these algorithms now to try a suite of these algorithms on on the simulator. So um, I made a little box flip up environment with the Drake Jim environment wrapper, and it's, it's, it's like three, three lines, really, to, to start running PPO on it. Um, admittedly, you can probably do better <laughs> than picking the absolute default arguments of everything, but I'm making a point here, right? So, um, so I'm really just gonna use the default MLP policy, which, by the way, is this, the fact that that is even a thing is interesting, right? That um, almost every paper that uses MLP policies has like the same architecture always, and it's a small network. So when people talk about deep RL, and then they, t they always use a three layer network with 255 hidden units, it's like, mm, um, that doesn't match. Okay, um, and then it's only again a few steps to run the actual simulation once you get it out. Uh, you can just ask the model for the, pol this is the policy coming out. It's you know, very simple and very uh, clean. My cost function is, uh, you know, like I said, it's the box angle. I put a little disincentive to have a large box velocity, angular velocity, uh, disincentive for effort, and uh, and finger velocity. And then I'll I'll show you the why there's a ten there in a minute. Okay, so I pump this. I put this in there. My machine at home is a fairly is bigger than my little laptop here. It's got like 56 effective cores. So I'm like. I'll run it on 48 of them. That way I can still, you know, tell it to stop if it goes badly, or, you, know, <laughs> you know, leave a few cores for the cursor. Um, okay, so and I just, I ran it last night and I woke up this morning to see what it, what it did and this is what it does. So you know, it's gonna reset every 10 seconds, sorry. Bunk, bunk, you know, it, Kind of solves the problem. Pretty like like the box always ends up <laughs> in a configuration that I guess I asked for. Um, but this is also you know this is um, it's sort of classic RL, right? I mean this is like what you what you expect and what you see. Um, I immediately thought I could make that better, and I know I definitely can. But like I said, I'm kind of allergic to toss, cost function tuning, and I um, and it takes a lot of time actually. I think to go from this step to like. It looks beautiful. I think there's like a lot of cost for you know lower returns, but it's awesome. I mean, it solved this problem you know with very little handholding. I can tell you, I had to like I had like three bugs 
that I had to work through, um, which are kind of funny, but I'll, I'll tell you about them in a second. Okay, and it's got a very robust, if you know, terrifying to run on a real robot uh, policy. Okay. Yeah, so, um, well, so, yeah, like, it ran to convergence. I mean, so this is what, it, you know, it, it, the curves kind of go up, and then they, they flutter around a lot of it. It'll get confused for a little while. It'll come back, right? So I, I don't claim that this is, like, terminated exactly at the best policy that, that PPO ever saw. This is just whatever was at when I woke up uh, this morning. Okay. Um, and so, so let me just, you know. So why the heck is the finger kind of going around like this after the box is up, right? My cost function was clearly said, don't move if you don't need to, right? So in any sense of like doing a good job of optimization, it's clearly like not even at a local minimum. I mean, there shouldn't be any, any problem for, you know, with it having done, do the same policy, but then once the box is up, just set the velocity to zero. So there's something so, you know, something weird kind of going on there. Maybe it's just entering states that weren't trained enough or, or whatever, right? It just didn't visit enough. And yeah, yeah, your question, sorry to get a, a roundabout answer here. So do I worry about it exploiting? I think there's, um, there's a very explicit way it started exploiting, which I'm gonna tell you in, in a second. But in general, I think, um, I mean, there's two features. There's one thing, which is that because we haven't put any biases on our policy, right? We haven't sort of uh, put any priors, let me call it, on the, on the policy. It's easy to be in a place where it's never visited before and take an insane action. I do worry about that a lot, right? We haven't said, you know, um, what you should do everywhere in any rigorous way. The other thing which is, I think people often talk about in terms of like value alignment, for instance, is that I think it's very hard to write a cost function that fully captures if it did optimize the cost function, but um, I think there's a, a lot of things that we encode in our robot solutions, which are subtle and they're implied, like, you know, don't move your finger at incredible velocities, is somehow implied in most of my optimizations in a way that maybe I've parameterized myself out of that. And by virtue of having not specifically specified it in these problems, it will find those solutions unless you tell it not to, right? So. Um, yeah, uh, Leslie Gelbling talks about, uh, what does she call it, uh, background utilities, for instance, right? She says, um, you know, you can tell the robot to put the dishes in the, in, from the sink into the dishwasher, but you also have to tell it, like, never throw a mug through the window and never stick your finger in a light socket and never do, you know, like, there's all these things that we sort of have in our head from common sense that we haven't told the robot not to do them. And if you just let it go in the simulator, it's going to do those things. And when you see real robot videos saying they learn to do something and they never threw their fist through the door or whatever, then you have to ask, why didn't it happen, <laughs> right? And what, how much reward engineering did you do in order to make that you know, not happen? Uh, this, this code is all, you know, I, I'm trying to make it run better on, in notebooks, but uh, otherwise it's gonna be pushed. Okay, so yeah, I used the stiffness control um, you'll see if you look at the code that, you, that we do have some mechanisms right inside multi-body plant to set random distributions so that it um, is easy to do. Uh, it's doing multi-processing using um, sub-processes. Uh, <coughs> if I were to, if this was my research project and I wanted to make it um, run faster or whatever, there's lots of things I could do. For instance, right now it's very, very many of the 10 second simulations sort of do something interesting for a second and then find themselves in some sort of fixed point and I just keep simulating for nine more seconds, right? And I should not do that. I should just truncate the simulation and, you know, but I'm just, uh, let it go. There's some, yeah, some funny bugs, right? So the first one, which is just like classic for me, it was like, I wrote down all my um, functions and I, I wrote them down as cost functions because I'm an optimal control person, not a reinforcement learning person. And, it, and it's like, wow, this looks like it's doing exactly the opposite of what I wanted to do. <laughs> and in fact, it was doing exactly the opposite of what I, I wanted it to do. So I, now my, you'll see my code says um, cost equal, or reward equals negative cost on the last line. Okay, that's just my bad. Um, when I did that, there was kind of a funny subtle thing, which was 
I had this early termination. If the simulation went unstable, I would stop the simulation. And that made sense in the, you know, when I had costs and I was minimizing, okay? But when I flipped the cost upside down, now if it got an early termination, it, re it would receive less cost. Okay, so it did, it did a very good thing for a while. It started learning how to flip the box up or whatever, but it slowly started discovering that if I crash, I don't incur much cost, okay? So I woke up, or I came back after dinner or whatever, and it's like, it's crashing all the time. Like, why is it every time, you know, it's like reporting so many crashes. Uh, and it, it had explicitly been told by me um, to crash, right? So, so it's pretty good at finding the bugs in your simulator if that's what you want it to do, right? Um, but to be clear, you know, th that cost function is like not tuned. It's really just, that's what I, um, so I added the 10 just so that the co the, every step got some positive reward and then it subtracted from 10 any costs. But as long as it was encouraged to keep taking steps, then that resolved that problem. Um, but these are just not tuned at all. Like those are the first numbers I typed in always, right? And, uh, and you could do much better, okay, yeah. So the question is, um, how do you fix the problem of getting wacky actions when you enter a state? Right. Um, I mean, Avi did mention uh, one idea. So I think there's a, there's a couple ideas there. First of all, you could try to, to somehow put a prior on your policy so that it does reasonable things and then maybe the neural network only learns um, something on, in addition to, to a reasonable controller. That would be one way to do it. Um, the one that Abi talked about was, was about um, restricting your policy to take actions that would keep you near your data, right? So if you say, I've, got, I've seen some amount of, you know, there's states that I've seen, there's states that I know I haven't seen. You can either keep track of them explicitly or you can keep track of them implicitly with a couple different approaches. Ensemble networks is, is one sort of, uh, one way people do that, okay? And you could try to ask your, your controller to stay near the data in, the, in, for, in safe territory, even if that could be conservative. But that, that comes up, there's a lot of different, you know, I've seen that sort of from the very controls side, I've seen that from, you know, the talk uh, last Thursday, and, and that's an, uh, another idea. Um, I mean, the other one I think would be to try to visit ag aggressively, you know, the, all the, somehow to try to, um, I mean, there's a good sense of what these distributions are. They're very hard to write down, of course, but there's a, there's the distribution that you're exploring. There's the distribution that you would have under the optimal policy, okay? And what your, your goal in learning should be to try to sample from the distribution that's relevant to the optimal policy. So there are various ways that try to do that quickly, right? The default way would just be like, you get some distribution from your bad policy and it extremely slowly walks towards your good policy. Anything you can do to try to get the, the relevant data uh, faster can also address this problem. So that's, sorry, three big things. But in the extreme case, right? So um, if I'm trying to do like a uh, swing up for a cart pole or an acrobat or something like this, the random policy like always visits these states <laughs> for a really long time. It takes a long, long time with random exploration to ever finally decide to get up here, right? But if you can do something like start it up here a bunch, you know, or, or you know, re then you can, um, you can skew the distribution to be the relevant states more quickly. I, don't, I hope I don't discourage questions by being long-winded in my answers. Okay, so let's just look um, a little under the hood of PPO. I don't wanna give the full um, derivation, but this is right from the PPO paper, since I picked PPO and used it for that. Um, <clears throat> The first thing you'll see is effectively the equation you saw in, uh, in the talk last Thursday and in your uh, problem set, right? This is the advantage function. This is the log probability of the, of the gradient, the gradient of the log probabilities, which is the, um, the reinforce, you know, uh, uh, idea roughly, okay? There's also some sort of complicated looking KL divergence type terms, okay, in the, that they, they come from TRPO. But if you look, there's actually, despite the, you know, that being emphasized in the paper, 
in the end, they say there's two versions of the algorithm. One of them uses that complicated KL divergence type thing, and one of them doesn't. It just does standard actor critic and clips, and, uh, and that's actually what people use. So, so actually, PPO, I think, in the end, is very much like the, the, the uh, old school actor critic algorithm, um, which I know best from, you know, the original actor critic papers were, were back in 99 by uh, Condon's and Sequis, and they did you know, sort of beautiful analysis of the, um, the convergence of those algorithms. <coughs> Okay, so um, that was a, it's an example that I hope motivates us to understand a little bit more about actor-critic algorithms, yeah? And, and um, the actor in actor-critic algorithms is a policy and the critic is a value function. So we need to learn a little bit more about uh, value functions. Okay, so uh, let's, I want you to have, um, you know, I want you to have the mathematical understanding of a value function, but I also just want you to have a very intuitive understanding of a value function. For manipulation, these things should be very, very intuitive, okay? Um, I almost wish, so, so like when, um, when Abhishek was, uh, was showing the, like the, uh, the dexterous hand opening the door, like I wish I had some magic AR goggles that would, cause, uh, that would somehow show me as it was progressing the value function estimate, right? What you would expect to see is the, if the value function is the expected cost to go, right? Or expected, I have to watch my cost versus reward. Uh, expected uh, long term cost or reward, depending on if you're a positive person or a negative person. Uh, I'm, I'm a negative person, apparently. Okay, so, um, so basically, it tells me, my value estimate says, if I'm in this state right now, and I continue to execute my policy, then what, what reward should I expect to receive? So what I would like to see for the, the you know, robot opening the door is that I would expect to see some future rewards and if I were to move the hand sort of in the direction of the door, I, I would expect to see sort of the, you know, the reward staying high, especially, let's say, let's say I only got a reward when I actually successfully turned the door knob, right? So I would expect to roughly see a, um, in the direction of the door that I'd get, there's a high reward prediction if I'm doing the right thing. If I deviate, I would expect to see my expected long-term reward go down, right? There's directions that I should not move that's taking me farther from my, my possible goal, okay? But if I'm moving in the direction, depending on if there's a discount or, or shaping or anything like this, that I would roughly like to see that my rewards are predicting, there's a, there's a, a path that's, it's, that this function is roughly telling me a path of where I should move through space in order to a, accomplish the task. And to make that a little bit more concrete, the simplest example that I always have to use, I think, just to 
to make that concrete is imagine you're a robot in a grid world. I'm sorry for those of you that know this. Uh, well, just take a second on it, okay? Imagine I'm a little robot living on a grid. Okay, and my action space is to move up, down, left, right. Okay, and let's say I have a goal that's down here and I have some bad regions, pits of despair or something like this over here. Okay, and let's say my, um, I get a reward of like a million when I get to the goal and I get some penalty when I fall in the pit and maybe I have a cost of taking an action. The reward function in this task is very simple. Everywhere here, the reward, or, you know, the reward might be just a small penalty for taking an action, okay? And, it, and it's not until I get to the goal that I actually get uh, some big one-step reward. But the value function captures the long-term expected reward. So it can tell me if I have an optimal policy, then that this is a pretty good state to be in, okay? And this is a, almost as good state to be in, and it can start backing up the, the long-term reward into a, a map that tells the system where to go, okay? So here's my goal. Here's my pit of despair, okay? And if I start solving from the reward function to the value function, then it's going to it's going to find this, um, this function now, which you see the height of the, the function. This is my cost formulation, sorry. Okay. Um, that this being in the pit is a very bad place to be. Okay. Being at the goal is a great place to be, but it, it goes through the entire state space and basically um, it figures out how much cost I would expect to incur in the, over the long run. Okay. And it provides effectively a map that gets me to the goal. So we'll work through the basic mechanics of it, but, but basically if I'm in some state here, rather than solving some long path planning problem, I can use my value function to just say, if I'm going downhill on the value function, then it's gonna take me where I need to be to the goal. It turns a long-term delayed reward problem into a one-step decision-making problem. Okay, so if this is my, my value function here, then um, you know, the, the features of it that, that make these, the algorithms like you just saw possible and that Avi was using in his, uh, in his lecture, right, is that it has this beautiful property, which is my value function at state x is equivalent to my one step cost plus my value function at the next state. And if I'm gonna do this for a particular set of parameters, then okay. This is a sum over many rewards from the current time up to n steps into the future. And it has a beautiful recursive property that says I can, my value function I can compute by day, saying I'll take the one step cost plus the cost to go from the next step, from wherever I get, I get to. This idea of a value function or cost to go function underlies like all of the fundamental results in optimal control. Uh, it's, you know, it's, the, it's the reason that we have good solutions to the linear quadratic regulator problem. It is the thing that underlies all of the deep results in robust control, right? And it is certainly a mainstay for reinforcement learning too, okay? What reinforcement learning has particularly emphasized is when you can't solve these value functions perfectly, but you're gonna use approximation methods to, to estimate the value function, okay? Um, I'll 
I'll make one more point here. Okay, so if I, if I were to somehow find the optimal value function, and our notation is typically something like this, okay, which is the, the cost to go that I would, I, would, I would get if I was following the optimal policy. Okay, that also has a beautiful recursive structure. Turns out that, like I said, if, I, if someone's computed the, the value function, the cost to go function, then it turns my long-term path planning problem into a short term. I just need to figure out what's the best thing to do in one step, plus, you know, given this map that someone gave me of the long-term uh, cost to go. Okay, I really think value functions are a fundamental property of, of control, of reinforcement learning, of, you know, of all these things. There's evidence from the brain that, that there are signals that, uh, you know, there are neurons in your dopaminergic system that light up when you anticipate you're gonna get reward. There's like, I, I don't think this is some arbitrary concept. This is deeply embedded in sort of the, the fabric of control, of making long-term decisions, okay. Um, <clears throat> And I think it, I, I really do think it's very intuitive. It's, it, it's a way to capture sort of the roadmap um, to the goal. So how do we use some concept of value functions in, uh, you know, in a, in a deep learning sort of setting, okay? Um, <clears throat> the first thing is that we need to think about the approximation version of this, right? RL is if you approximate dynamic programming, in fact, one of the um, one of the conferences, the the few conferences that really focused on RL all the way through was was a conference called ADP RL. Still alive, but. Um, yeah, it, approximate dynamic programming in RL. This was like one of the places you could continue to publish RL works even when it was not super popular, okay? Um, and it's asking the question of if I use, if I wanna store or um, represent V hat with a function approximator, let's say, then there's, a, there's the objective that's sort of natural given the sort of recursive structure. You'd like to have V hat given some, um, let me call it alpha, the parameters of my, of my function approximator minus So this is a, now becomes like a supervised learning loss. This is called the Bellman residual. You can similarly, you can do this on policy or you can do it for the optimal policy if you can compute it. Okay, so it turns out that learning cost to go functions, it's not surprising I guess, can be done mostly with supervised learning. So it makes sense that you could try to train a, a neural network to try to represent a value function. One thing that doesn't make sense, I don't know if people have caught up on this, right? So I write this down, Abhishek wrote this down too, roughly, he did it for the Q functions, okay? This isn't actually what people do. I don't know, do people know that, right? So uh, every once in a while you'll see people, people talk about solving this exactly. But actually this doesn't work as well as, as, um, as you would expect. 
anybody know the catch, the subtlety that's written here, but often not done in practice? The way you would think to, to do this with supervised learning, right? With this, if you wrote, this is your loss function, and then you would try to take the gradient of this whole thing with respect to alpha, right? People don't do that. They almost always fix this and only take the gradient with respect to this, okay? There's a bunch of ways to, that people talk about that, but certainly the TD updates do that. Sometimes they'll talk about this as the target network Right? But it, empirically, it seems to work better to, uh, to fix this side, this right-hand side, and only update this side. There's some theory about why that, that is, but it's always struck me as frustrating. <laughs> um, right? There's some notion that it sort of backs up better, uh, you, know, which you, you want to encourage, encourage it going sort of backwards in time, and maybe this is the, the way to do it or something like this. Okay, But this is our, already a, one place where I think uh, it's a little unsatisfying. Our, our theory, uh, theoretical understanding of that is a little unsatisfying. Okay, but mostly this is a, a supervised learning. Throw it in PyTorch, you know, take your gradients, lock those, per, lock those parameters, and then take your gradients, and you can train your value function. Okay, if you look at the code in stable baselines, it almost doesn't even call out the, um, you know, so, so my code said MLP policy, right? Um, so the inputs you know in stable baselines and a lot of the um, of the algorithms basically you have X coming in you've got your big neural network here and you have your actions coming out that's what you have your pi and they just will add one extra output to the same architecture for v hat, okay? Uh, so it's actually, you know, plus value all hidden in this. So it's very common to use the same architectures for your policy and just throw one extra output on for your, for your value function. All right. Value functions are intuitive, value functions are essential. There, um, there are reasonable approaches to, um, to train a value function, okay? <clears throat> now, here's where you, there's a lot more options that open up, okay? So what do you do with your value function once you have it? In the classic dynamic programming world, um, you'd say once I have my value function, I've solved the problem, I'm done. Because uh, if I have a value function, then I can say my optimal policy, if I found the optimal value function, then my optimal policy really, like I said, should just be the one step. I should minimize over u my one step cost plus my value function. So if I know the value function, I know the policy. Mostly. The problem with this is that it assumes I know the dynamics. And I know the cost, right? I don't fault anybody for assuming they know the cost most of the time. I mean, there are settings, but in robotics, I always say we know the cost, okay? Um, but knowing you know the dynamics, if you need to have, know the dynamics in order to make your decision, then this is hard to use in a setting where I, you know, I'm like got a robot uh, making salad. Okay. So the alternatives here one is a Q learning, and the second one is actor critic. Q learning is roughly says, what, why don't I just take this whole function here and I'll just learn that instead, right? So I'll just call this thing Q. 
If I learn that whole thing, you know, then my optimal policy is um, just looking up Q. I don't need to know something. I don't have some other hidden uh, terms that I have to know. Right, and it has other benefits like off policy, which is a big deal. I'm not trying to uh, make that a small deal. That's a huge deal, um, and other benefits. But I think the first idea, the first reason you might need a Q function is because um, you don't have the model. So having just the value function by itself isn't enough to, to, to tell me what control action I should take. But having just the Q function is enough because I can just minimize directly on the Q. The actor critic thing is make an explicit policy parameterization You're basically trying to learn this function, you know, the, the, minim the minimizer, as well as V simultaneously. Those are two solutions to the same, uh, they have different aspects, but I'd say first and foremost, they are two solutions to this problem of having the value function alone is not enough. Now it's interesting, this min over, Q, min over U for Q is a non-trivial problem to solve, potentially. If Q is a deep network and U is a continuous action space, then that means that's amount, that amounts to solving some potentially very non-convex problem in order to take, even take your actions here, okay? So as a result, for continuous action spaces, people often prefer actor critic, right? There are a few examples of people that stay in the Q learning domain and try to just do this, solve this optimization, right? Um, um, that's an approach being pushed hard at Google, uh, <clears throat> where they're saying, we're gonna just learn the Q function and we'll just solve that optimization on the fly. That's what the opt part is. Um, they also, QtOpt is more than that. It's talk, it talks about how to do decentralized Q, Q learning also. But um, I think there's a group at DeepMind also that's uh, quite still thinking about uh, the advantages of Q learning from experience replay kind of perspective. And that started with, uh, with Martin a long time ago. He was maybe the first to talk about you know, fitted Q learning with the neural network. And did a, a big series of experiments. 2005 was right when I was getting my PhD. We were, um, you know, we were at the, the same conferences and, and he was talking about Q, neural Q learning at the time. And I remember that well, okay. <clears throat> All right, so this is a big, um, you know, this is a sort of a big idea, a big branch of, of, of work, but it tends to be more popular in the discrete actions. And if you look at the sort of, um, stable baselines and you look at the, all the, the DQN and other methods that are sp explicitly Q-learning, they're, they're uh, optimized for discrete sp action spaces. And actor critic is the version that uh, works really well with continuous action spaces. All right, so why, so, so now let's come, come back to this, um, the view we had of policy gradient where uh, we have a, you know, we have a policy, we're doing black box optimization on it. Why would we need a value function? Why would that help? Can we connect those dots? 
Why is it useful? So it makes sense if you have a value function that's not enough. But now let's flip back from the other perspective. If I've got a policy, why isn't that enough? Why is, um, if, I'm, if I've got a policy, why do I also use a value function? Why is it helpful to do both simultaneously? You might start in a place where the policy is not trained well. And so how does the value function help you with that? So you kind of know how to ask for more than just a comment and get an update. Okay, so, you, so, um, so you're, you're, you're leveraging this fact that the value function provides a map, right? It roughly tells you where to go from, from a long way out, right? Yes, okay, good. So, I, so I, I'm with you on that. So, so um, I think the value function, if you can learn it simultaneously, can give you um, the ability to train your policy more locally, right? There's a, there's a very specific role it plays too in the policy gradient world, um, which I wonder if we can capture, if anybody, if anybody knows, yeah. Yeah, it provides a baseline. We did a, right, we just did a problem set on this, right? The advantages functions in, in your problem set were exactly this idea, okay? So what I, what does that baseline provide for the reinforced algorithms, right? If I'm doing my, my um, long-term optimization, okay, and I'm getting noisy random samples of the objective function, then if I'm trying to estimate a gradient locally, okay, I'm gonna have maybe noisy estimates of my gradients. I think the pictures in the problem set were actually better, right? Where the, You'd like to be going straight downhill, but in practice, the reinforced algorithm is taking you all over the place, sometimes uphill, sometimes downhill, whatever. <clears throat> and the reason for that is you don't know from a single rollout of my robot, I get a score of 42, right? Was that a good score or a bad score, right? And if I ran almost the same policy from almost the same initial conditions and I got a 38, is that, was that a difference in noise or was that a difference in actual cost? Right, so distinguishing between noisy samples from a rollout and true signal is a hard problem, okay? And if you know that my expected return with my current policy was 40, <laughs> because I've been in this vicinity before and I've learned the value of my current policy, then that gives you this sharp tool to distinguish but that 38 was a good thing to do, I should try to make that happen more often, and 42 was not such a good thing to do, right? The particular role it plays is um, let me think how I want to say this. The value estimate is a baseline in policy gradient. and can, can dramatically reduce the variance. The amount of random walking you do as you descend the landscape can go down a lot with a good baseline. I hope you saw that in your problem sets. Okay, so in practice, the actor critic methods are winning for these continuous control for all these reasons, right? They're better than the policy search because they can make the policy search much more effective. In the case of you have a multi-step problem, if you, did, if you have a single step problem, then the concept of value function, you know, the general black box optimization world doesn't think about value functions because it doesn't assume anything about the long-term multi-step uh, problem. But if you do have a multi-step problem, then this notion of a value function becomes a, an important one. Okay, that's sort of the rough taxonomy of these methods. Let's dig into just a few more specific details.
So the actor critic algorithms actually, um, and even the, the value estimate algorithms, I should say there's good work, including that Conda and Sinsequist work from um, early 2000s, uh, or 99 actually, um, <clears throat> that understand some, some rigorous statements about what actor critic or value uh, function learning does, even with function approximators. Typically, you know, the statements are if you can represent your value function perfectly, then you can, many of these algorithms enjoy strict convergence to the true value function. That's like a super powerful thing to say. The fact that if I, you know, I will eventually learn the true cost to go. That's a very powerful thing to say. There's a next tier of value methods that use like linear function approximators, where we can say rigorously that um, it will find the, fun that it will converge to the closest um, value function in the class that is close to your data. There's like really strong convergence results for linear function approximators. Okay. Um, <clears throat> most of those are based on this notion of, you know, value functions being a function of x. I mean, even the modern analysis of what's trying to people, people trying to understand why is deep RL working. You know, there's people trying to connect ideas from deep learning and supervised learning with these old results from linear function approximators, okay? But they're all convert, they're all based on, you know, all of the good theory says that the, the cost to go is a function of my state. If you look at the code in stable baselines or in, you name any of the, these RL algorithms, almost always, right, the gym just has actions coming in, has observations coming out, right? And the critic and the policy takes observations in, takes my actions out, and my value estimate. Okay, so there, where I think of the, my notation is that my dynamics are f of x n, u n, my observations are some other function. This value function is not v of x, it's v of y, okay? Let me write in big letters here. Uh, observations are not states. <laughs> this is like my, one of my big gripes, I guess, with it's just the sloppiness, I guess, of people um, writing code and the like. Let me just make, make that point, okay? I've got a box here. I've got some money here, okay? Do you want to open the box? There's a lot of money in that box, right? Okay. I've got something you probably don't want. I mean, you can have it if you want, but... Uh, Okay, my observations are the same. I know this is a silly trick, but you know, my observations are exactly the same, right? But my value, how much I want to open that box has changed completely, right? Observations are not states, especially the biggest, the biggest culprit here, you'll see people saying like images are our states. Right? And that can be true if you have partial observability and you have uh, you know, quasi-static dynamics and all these things, but beware of this, please, right? Observations in general are not states. Partial observability is the easiest example for that, but dynamics already is enough that a single image doesn't tell me the velocity that my cheetah is running at or something like that. Okay, so there's this big important idea here, which is um, either your observations, you need to take a history of observations, um, you need to have a recurrent network, all this discussion we talked about before. There are ways to make this okay. Or there are places where, if you think about this as just a very approximate version of the true value function V of X, um, the actor critic algorithms can still flourish, if, even if your value function is just, it doesn't have the information that's required 
to, to estimate the true cost to go, it can still do good things in terms of improving the convergence of your actor critic algorithm. Okay? But I think any analysis or even just debugging of these tools needs to be aware that this, you know, all the foundations of RL are based on, I end up actor critic algorithms, are based on some analysis of the potential convergence of the value function to the true value function. And if you stick in a deprived state representation, then I think there's really nothing that tells, I, I don't know how to tell you if it's doing a good job or not, because it's, you're asking it to solve a different problem, right? And I think we're, we're lacking the tools. And I would say in general, when, um, you know, even just playing with the box flip up last night, right? I think that, um, or if you have, if we have student projects, if, if, if you have a project and you're working away and your trajectory optimization isn't doing what you expected or your, your uh, dynamics isn't doing what it's expected or your differential IK isn't doing what's expected, I can almost always tell you, you know, you, you can come up with yourself, right? But there's almost always something like, okay, it should definitely do X, right? There's, there's theorems that say it should have this property. Make sure it has this property, otherwise you have a bug, right? And you can kind of go down the list and you can vet these very complex algorithms you can debug, I think, very effectively because there's a deep theory behind many of those algorithms, right? RL's theory is deep, but it's harder, <laughs> right? Like, I really, uh, I think RL is in this, um, low, you know, this, this place where it's starting to work incredibly well, but it's missing some of the fundamental theory that would even help you, not just if you care about theory, just if you want to debug your algorithm. Like, should it, you know, it went downhill, and I, I, can, I could feel myself, like, making stories, like, oh, it wanted to do X, so my cost went, you know, but I, no, it's, it might have just gone downhill because it's the random algorithm going in a random direction with, with 50 random rollouts, right? So um, I think there's big role for the theory to play to talk about, for, you know, there's lots of good work already on, on approximate value functions, but I think there's a big push that needs to happen in terms of, like, closing the gap between theory and practice for this stuff, this stuff to work better. So let me try to um, say a few things about sort of the ongoing theory of RL, right? Of deep RL. And I, I, I think this is just such a vibrant um, area right now because empirically it, it's working so well, right? Um, Maybe it even starts with a quick, um, you know, some, some results from deep supervised learning. There's a f only a few, I mean, there's lots of ideas out there, but a f there's a few sort of really big, um, you know, sort of dominant ideas about maybe why supervised learning seems to work now. Uh, you've probably heard of double descent curves and all these these different ideas, but it's, the arguments roughly go into uh, two parts, okay? So the first argument is that if you're doing well, your training error, your training loss goes to zero. And the argument there, there's a handful of different um, sort of pieces of, of work on this, okay, but um, why does your training loss go to zero for arbitrarily complicated nonlinear objectives, it seems, right? Um, there's a very simple argument that people make. One of them is called the neural tangent kernel. The argument is that if you are in the massive over-parameterization regime, you've got a big deep network and a relatively smaller set of data, okay, then even a random initialization of your deep network produces some outputs in your last layer, okay, 
and it produces a rich enough basis of possible outputs that the last layer can effectively just do least squares. Okay, so you can get, so basically, if your second to last layer spans all of the possible space and your last layer is just a linear layer, then you actually have a least squares problem in the last layer, okay? And then all of the other stuff in the beginning can just be left, you, you'll get to zero training loss almost trivially if you have an ultra wide last layer, okay? And that's a sort of in the massive overparameterization regime, that's an explanation for maybe why your training loss might go to zero, okay? And the second part then is then sort of this implicit regularization. Of stochastic gradient descent. Okay, so if I'm able to get, fit my training data by just having a really wide second to last layer the last layer is just solving a least squares problem. Then I get to, in the null space of my solutions, of, of, of zero training loss, I get to move, walk around inside the parameters of my earlier layers of the network. And there's some, there's a lot of ideas about why stochastic gradient descent will continue to walk around even after you've got zero training loss and will find a solution that generalizes well to new examples. Right? That's like sort of, the simplest brush pass of like what people are talking about in deep supervised learning, okay? And there's really, you know, I think it's not quite what happens in practice, but there's this massive overparameterization regime that's happening in practice, yeah? Sorry, what was the reason why those functions were generalized? Yeah, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, ideas about it, but it, it seems that of the solutions which fit my data perfectly, I mean, SGD tends to walk around and find them that, that have a, they minimize particular norms of the, of the parameters and stuff like this that, that tend to give you nice smooth functions around your data. And even do ridiculous things around noisy data, like you know, fit the, the generalizing curve, but uh, explain, still ex explain noisy data with zero training loss. It's, 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 a, big, it's a big topic that I, I don't mean to go into, but thank you for asking. Yeah, the, the, the point I'm I want to make, though, is that the theory we have for deep supervised learning, which assumes massive overparameterization and ultra-wide last layers, I, I simply doesn't explain why we're having success in deep RL with a 255-layer, 255 you know, three-layer network. It's just not the same regime at all, right? So I don't see how this, I, there's, there's, there's more, gap to close in understanding the connections between sort of why supervised learning, it, it's not enough, I think, to just say supervised learning works, so RL starts working, okay? I do think some of the, you know, black box optimization that we talked about maybe is part of the, I should, you know, I think black opt the story I told you a little bit about, about black box optimization working fairly well, even in noisy landscapes, I do think that's part of the story that's, that's emerging, is that, that some of the, what seems, what sounded to me as very naive algorithms for gradient descent in RL might be getting around some of the fundamental complexity of the landscape in a nice, like, smart way, right? So I think that's part of the emerging story is the sort of black box optimization. Both in its, you know, um, can sort of its local robustness to bad landscapes. And some of its sort of global optimization aspects.
Right? I think both of those have a role to play to understanding when and why RL works. I think the stochastic objectives that we talked about is, a, is an important part of the story. It connects to the idea of randomized smoothing. Remember I said if you have a discontinuous loss function like this, but then you take the ex expected value over some kernel, you might smooth the loss function out beautifully, right? Just by having um, a stochastic formulation instead of a deterministic formulation. I think this is a big part of it. In fact, I would go so far as to hypothesize. So I have a, a couple versions of my box flipping code, okay? The one I showed you that I trained last night was the box has random initial conditions, but it's the same box all the time because I'm using full state feedback. The next version that I just haven't run yet takes key points from the box, right? And, uh, and then I can take and make different size boxes and different masses of boxes. You would think that that would be a harder optimization problem. But I'll go out on a limb and I would say, when I run it tonight or whatever, <laughs> that it's, it's probably gonna be an easier optimization problem or a let's say a better optimization problem. I would actually expect to say that uh, the policies we would get out of that optimization might be less ridiculous. And I would guess that it learns faster, uh, you know, learns reasonable policies faster. And my intuition for that is that I think when you ask too narrow of a problem, then there are many quirky solutions that almost solve the problem. But when you ask for a distribution, to, to, that the same policy solves a whole distribution of problems, you know, like all the boxes, then all the quirky solutions where you just happen to throw your finger into the back corner and knock it up and the half box happened to land on it, whatever, that just doesn't happen if you have arbitrary boxes, right? It's just not a good solution. The solution that works for all boxes of all sizes, whatever you go, you put your finger on and you twist it up, I would think. I'll find out, I'll run it tonight, <laughs> okay? Um, and I think there's something important that we need to understand um, in that space, right? Because um, here's the thing, right? RL can't solve every problem. Like we know that. You can write any optimization problem as an RL problem, as a one-step RL problem. Like there are NP-hard optimization problems. We just know there's problems. Like we would be, I would be mining Bitcoin now, if, if, if RL solved every problem, because uh, you know, it just doesn't do that, right? There's something about the types of problems that we're asking, which yeah, RL is solving well, right? And it's something about the distribution of problems that we're asking. I mean, I, roughly I would say that maybe the biggest thing maybe is manipulation is easy. if we formulate it this way, right? I think that's maybe my number one takeaway. I'll say a few more of the existing work stuff, but I think, I think deeply that there's something about the distribution of problems that the real world gives us. I mean, my human intelligence is limited also, right? And somehow I'm pretty effective in my kitchen. I mean, that's great, but uh, you know, I can get around my kitchen without throwing boxes through the window, right? So there's something about like the distribution of kitchens that in the world that doesn't have the crazy scenarios, right? And I think there's somehow that makes the optimization problems better that I can learn. There's something about the distribution of the world and the distribution of our problems that I don't know how to capture yet, but it seems important, right? There's a bunch of good work on control parameterizations. that make, you know, or value function parameterizations that aren't super present in the, in the neural network deep RL community, but, it, but they're sort of coming. They're coming behind and they're taking 
even classic control problems, LQR, LQG, some of these, these classic control problems, asking does stochastic gradient descent work for them? Okay, what about robust control formulations? Some of the formulations that we really understand well from, a, from an optimization perspective, can stochastic gradient descent, how do, they, how, do, how do we understand stochastic gradient descent on those problems, okay? And there's some really deep things happening there. And it's still, while it's still a long way from the neural network case, I feel like that's the theory community, you know, chasing, right? And, and if we can even catch up a little bit more, then I think it's gonna give good dividends. So, so as an example, for instance, um, some of the work that, uh, that uh, Jack and others in my group have been thinking about, uh, if you have a convex reparameterization e.g. from robust control, right, there's, a, and if you look at my underactuated notes, there's a bunch of cases where it's like, here's a crazy hard problem, but if you change problem, you know, change coordinates into this new set of decision variables, then you can write it as a optimization problem that's convex, right? The fact that there are, those tricks even exist, actually implies something topologically if, there's, if they have certain properties, those reparameterizations, like if they're smooth and other things like this. About, let's say, policy gradient. And there's a sort of a stream of results from the theory community saying, well, actually, LQR, we know how to solve it in, in MATLAB, you know. Um, but actually that means that we can solve it with stochastic gradient descent too. Even though the cost function is not convex in the control parameters and the policy parameters, it can't have local minima because of the existence of these reparameterizations. And even some pretty hard, pro like increasingly harder problems, we're actually saying, oh, that would, that would have worked with SGD also. And I think as we grow that body of knowledge, we'll get closer and closer um, to, to like understanding why these things work, right? But there is some limits, right? I guess I said Bitcoin, that's not what I wrote in my notes, but here we go, yeah. Uh, someone's gonna do that next week now that I wrote it. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, not, yeah, it, it, it doesn't solve, there's like, there's problems that are just fundamentally hard. We have hardness results, hardness theories you can write all of them as, a, as an RL problem. Like I said, it's, it's hopelessly generic, right? And you're not gonna run, you know, PPO and, and suddenly solve that. So there's something more going on between our RL algorithms and our RL formulations. There's some structure that's hidden there in the cases where it's working that's not visible yet, but we have to discover it. That should be our mission. Okay, so that was a whirlwind uh, tour of, of RL in a, in a couple of lectures. And uh, happy Thanksgiving. I will happy, I'm happy to keep helping with projects and uh, we'll transition into some like the boutique lectures that you guys picked uh, starting next week.